Jackson. Our first award goes to a surgical science paper. The lead author, Lindsay Tetro, will present a clinical prediction model to assess surgical outcome in patients with cervical spondylotic myelopathy, internal and external validation using the prospective multicenter AO, spine, North American, and international data sets of 743 patients. Thank you. I'd like to thank the North American Spine Society and the Spine Journal for this recognition. And I would also like to acknowledge the principal investigator, Dr. Failings, as well as the co-investigators of the CSM North America and International Studies for conducting such high-quality prospective research. So the key clinical question of this research is, can we predict surgical outcomes in patients with cervical spondylotic myelopathy? And are these predictors consistent at a global level? So we've come up with four reasons why prediction is important and how a clinical prediction rule could be valuable in a surgical setting. So the first is to manage patients' expectations of surgery. And according to Davidson, patient satisfaction is closely linked to expectations. So a clinical prediction rule can quantify a patient's likely outcome, and then a clinician can use this information during the surgical consent process to manage patients' expectations. And this point is closely related to the second point, which is to counsel concerned patients as to potential treatment options. Third, a clinical prediction rule can influence practice and provide decision-making support to surgeons. And with respect to this point, we do have to identify what variables we can and cannot change. So for example, a patient's age, we can't change. But something like duration of symptoms and preoperative myelopathy severity score, we can change by encouraging a timely, surgical, a timely referral, referral for surgical consultation. And the fourth point here is really to align surgeons' perceptions of outcome with more objective evidence. So the key objective of this study is to first develop a clinical prediction rule to determine functional outcomes in patients with CSM undergoing surgery, and then to take this model and validate it externally on a, on a second data set. So the original model was created to distinguish between patients with mild myelopathy postoperatively, which we define as an MGOA score greater than or equal to 16, and those with substantial residual neurological impairment, which was defined as an MGOA less than 16. And we've actually validated this cutoff of 16, and we did this by first defining the MCID of the MGOA, which is the minimal clinically important difference. And using three different methods, we came, we defined the MCID as 1.5. So if we look at patients in the data set who improve on average by one point, or who, who improve by this MCID, their MGOA at one year is on average 16. So this was, we were able to validate this cutoff point uh, this way. So our first model was developed using data from the uh, CSM North America study, which enrolled 272 patients from 12 global sites. And all these patients had symptomatic CSM with at least one clinical sign of myelopathy. Uh, we then took this model and we validated it externally using data derived from the CSM International study, which enrolled 471 patients from 16 global sites. So here's our model from the North American data set, and this was published last year in JBJS. And so based on these findings, we can see patients are more likely to achieve this outcome of 16 or greater if they do not have psychiatric disorders, which are namely bipolar and depression, if they are milder preoperatively as evaluated by the MGOA, if they are younger, do not have impaired gait, if they're non-smokers, and if they have a shorter duration of symptoms. Now, because this, this model was developed in or on North American patients, it does truly reflect the, the population characteristics the culture, and the medical systems of North America. So we can really say with confidence that this model can effectively predict outcome in patients from across North America. However, still, the question still remains, is this model equally predictive in an external population? So for example, the case on the left is a, a Japanese patient with an ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. And the patient on the right, again, is from Asia with a congenitally narrow spinal canal. So can our model, which was developed in a North American population, can it predict outcome in these, uh, these two patients 
from international sites. And so this is where this study, uh, this was the objective of this study, is was to essentially externally validate this model. So why is external validation important? Well, there may exist differences across populations in disease definitions and presentation, demographics, in the reliability of predictors and outcome variables, in socioeconomic status and access to care, and in management strategies. So all of these differences may lead to differences in patient prognosis. And so what external validation does is it assesses whether these differences affect the predictive performance of our model. So for example, I'll walk you through this, this table. The derivation group is a CSM North America study. The temporal validation group is the international study. And then we took the international study and we separated it into four subsamples based on geographic regions. And as you can see, there are some key demographic differences between the regions. So on average, patients from North America were older and patients from Asia Pacific were younger. And patients from Latin America had a longer duration of symptoms. Uh, but most interestingly is the variable psychiatric disorder. So that's bipolar and depression. And so there was a significantly lower reported incidence in Latin America, Asia Pacific, and Europe than there was in North America. And so we're, we're unsure whether this is perhaps surgical selection or if it's just cultural reluctance to admit to mental illness. But what we do know is that this lower incidence may affect the generalizability of our original prediction model, especially because in North America, psychiatric disorders was a significant predictor. So we evaluated validity by assessing the discrimination, which is computed by looking at the area under the receiver operating curve. We assess the calibration, which is how closely our predicted probabilities match our observed probabilities. And then we reran this model on the international data set. So based on discrimination, there was no significant differences between the area under the receiver operating curve of the original model and um, compared to the area under the curve for the international model. So with respect to discrimination, this model was externally valid. Uh, this, this graph shows the calibration of the original model. So as you can see, the model, the observed probabilities and the predicted probabilities are closely matched. So the red dots should closely resemble uh, that black line which would indicate perfect calibration. So in the validated model, we see that the dots deviate upwards, which means we are over or we are underestimating, slightly underestimating outcome, uh, which is likely better than overestimating outcome. If we rerun the model on the international data set, we see that two of our variables become statistically insignificant. So this is psychiatric disorders. I think um, I've explained probably why this was insignificant because of the lower reported incidents. And then the second is duration of symptoms. And duration of symptoms is an interesting uh, variable because I, I don't think it's too reliable. So this is patient reported duration of symptoms. So when the patient believed their symptoms started. Um, but we do believe that the real duration of symptoms, so if a patient has had core compression f for a longer period of time, they're more likely to have irreversible histological damage and they're less likely to have this so-called optimal outcome. So even though it's not statistically significant, we do believe that duration of symptoms is still an important predictor of outcome. So these are the conclusions. The original model displayed good external validity. The predictors determined in the North American study were also important in external populations. And so these are the five important predictors at a global level. Age, duration of symptoms, baseline severity score, smoking status, and impaired gait. Thank you.